Good morning. Welcome to Beth Haven Baptist Church adult Sunday school class. And of course, right now we're um, doing things a little bit differently. So this is uh, being recorded on Saturday morning, but um, we hope that you are well. We, we uh, hope that everything's going well for you and your family. Uh, let me say uh, before I get into the lesson <clears throat> that um, we're we are available here at the church, and uh, personally, if you have prayer needs, please call us. Don't wait. Um, remember, we're not getting together as a group on Wednesday nights to take up prayer requests, so please email them to us or text them to us and, and make sure that we uh, are aware of any prayer needs that you have, and not only prayer needs, but if you have any personal needs, if you need anything in regards to food or personal items and you're not able to uh, get out and get them, uh, please let us know because we want to be a help to you during this time. And we're looking forward to the opportunity when we can all get back together. And what a blessing. Times like this remind us of how important it is that we do get together, that we are able to assemble together and teach and preach and and fellowship more important, uh, not more important, but as important, the fellowship of of uh, one another and encouragement that that brings and the prayer uh, that we can have together. And we're excited um, about the small groups that we're able to do, the small groups of 10, uh, which is according to the governor's um, uh, order right now. But we're uh, really, of course, looking forward to the opportunity for all of us to be back together uh, in, in the church house. Amen. I'm going to talk to you this morning <clears throat> about a topic related to wisdom, and we've talked about wisdom quite a bit in the past. I know this isn't where your normal lessons have been, um, but um, we have several families that are have been under quarantine uh, for the last couple of weeks because of it, it being in places where there was some exposure. Uh, of course, Matt and Andrea are out of quarantine now, praise the Lord. Uh, they didn't have any problems at all. Jeremiah and Cindy, I believe, are out of quarantine as of uh, yesterday. And um, uh, the Reddicks are still under quarantine, and the Fraunhofers are under quarantine. And so Brother Fraunhofer was going to uh, be teaching these classes, or he will be, uh, as soon as they're uh, out of that uh, quarantine time. So uh, in the meantime, we've got about two weeks here, and I felt like God directed me in this passage today uh, to deal with this topic, and that is how the world recognizes wisdom. How does the, when the world looks at us, how do they see or recognize wisdom in us? And, you know, often we talk about wisdom from a personal perspective, from how we uh, are to demonstrate or how we are to pursue wisdom. And, and of course, we've talked about in the past the fact that uh, you know, I, I've, I had always had an idea of wisdom as being the fruit of knowledge and understanding and then it coming to a point of wisdom, but that's backward. We've talked about that in, in not too distant past, how the Bible always puts wisdom first and knowledge last, and wisdom being uh, the ability or the instilled uh, natural ability from God, and even in, in um, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, or Jeremiah uh, James, he says, if any man lack wisdom, let him, what? Ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally. And so in the Bible, we see this, that God gives wisdom, and through the exercise of God-given wisdom, there is understanding, and then we can add knowledge to understanding to perfect wisdom our ability and perfect wisdom in us. So wisdom, understanding, and knowledge is the Bible order. And you can look that up. That's uh, almost everywhere in the Bible. It's given in that order because that's the process that God uses to produce this or bring this uh, <clears throat> to fruition in our life. And it's important to, when we look at the scriptures, then <clears throat> we see things in us. And, and I challenge you in this, if there's an area you lack wisdom in, if if it's, if it's in being a father or a mother or a spouse, if it's in your job, if it's in some area of ministry that you say, I just know that I'm deficient in this area. I'm not being what I could be or what God wants me to be in this area. Ask God. He says, if you lack wisdom, 
ask of God and God will give you the wisdom that you need. And then you must exercise yourself in that wisdom. And God blesses that. What an encouragement it is to know that that wisdom is not dependent upon mental capacity in the sense of, boy, the smarter a person is, the more wise they are. Because quite frankly, we see this in the world and uh, that, that the many times those that are incredibly intelligent, uh, incredibly smart, make really foolish decisions also in their lives and, and do foolish things that bring their destruction or bring their, their selves misery in this world. And, and so it's not dependent on your intellect in the sense of how smart you are. It's dependent on whether you go to God and you say, Lord, I need this wisdom. I need this in my life. And so when the world looks at us, though, how do they recognize whether there's wisdom in us? How do they, how do they tell if that wisdom is present in us? And I, of course, the scriptures give us a lot concerning this issue of wisdom, specifically with Solomon. And we see uh, as Solomon gains wisdom, how did he gain it? He asked God, give me wisdom so I can lead your people and, and rule the nation of Israel. And what did God do? He gave wisdom. Well, that's what it says in James, doesn't it? And we see his wisdom illustrated in a number of different uh, passages in, uh, in the Old Testament, specifically uh, concerning where uh, the two mothers came and with the baby and whose baby was it. And we see the wisdom of Solomon exhibited there. But then we get to Second Chronicles in chapter number 9, and now the tales of Solomon's wisdom have gone all the way down into um, Sheba, and, and that would be down in Africa. And so the tales of, of Solomon's wisdom have begun to stretch across continents and uh, down across the continent of Africa. And the queen of Sheba hears of the, uh, the words of Solomon, and she hears of the wisdom of Solomon, and she says, I want to go and see whether this thing is true. I I don't want to just believe the, the rumors, so to speak, about Solomon. I want to go and see if it is really true that Solomon has this kind of wisdom. And so in 2 Chronicles chapter number 9, if you read along with me, beginning in verse number 1, it says, And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem. So her, her uh, idea for proving him had to do with, man, I've got all these questions. I've got some really hard questions. But we all have hard questions, don't we? We, we have things that are difficult for us to understand or difficult for us to, to grab hold of. And she had a number of these type of questions. And she said, I'm going to go and see whether he actually has this wisdom or whether this is just, you know, overblown. And she goes on, it says, and with a very great company and camels that bear spices and gold in abundance and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. She asked him all the questions that she had. In verse two, and Solomon told her all her questions and there was nothing hid from Solomon, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he had built and the meat of his table and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and his cupbearers also and their apparel and his ascent by which he ascended up into the house of the Lord. There was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, it is, it was a true report, which I heard in mine own land of thine acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not their words until I came, and my eyes had seen it, and behold, the half of the greatness of thy wisdom was not told me, for thou exceedest the fame that I heard. Happy are thy men, and happy are thy ser these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and hear thy wisdom." Be, blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee to set thee on his throne, to be king for the Lord thy God, because the, thy God loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore made he thee king over them to do judgment and justice. There's um, <clears throat> nine things that I notice in this passage in regards to what the queen of Sheba saw in Solomon and in this situation that confirmed to her 
that there was great wisdom here. And as a matter of fact, she goes to the point of saying, you know, before I came, I was suspicious. I didn't believe that what the rumors I heard were too true. But now that I've been here and I've, and I've uh, 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 seen these things, I've been able to observe all of this. Now I know I hadn't even heard half of what the truth was concerning your wisdom. That's an uh, amazing statement, really, because uh, you can imagine how rumors spread uh, they spread to enlarge stories, don't they? Uh, no one ever uh, tells that fishing story that goes the, the wrong way. Hey, did you hear about Bill, man? He caught, a, he caught a bass 12 inches long. And the next person, did you hear about Bill? He caught an 8-inch bass. You know, it doesn't go that way, does it? It goes the other way. Uh, it goes uh, to bigger. And yet she still said, I hadn't heard the half of what was the truth about this wisdom that God's given you. So what are the things that she saw here or heard that caused her to recognize this wisdom that God had given? Well, first of all, what we say and what Solomon said. In verse number 2, it says, And Solomon told her all her questions, and there was nothing hid from Solomon which he told her not. Now, I, I don't know what kind of questions that the Queen of Sheba may have come up with at that time, what kind of uh, you know scientific questions maybe that she had, or moral questions that she may have had, or philosophical questions. I'm sure there were some of each of those type of things, and, and uh, there were maybe Maybe questions about counseling type scenarios. Maybe maybe she was thinking about troubles that she had, uh, worries, doubts, anxieties, fear, depression, and maybe she asked questions about those type of things. Maybe she asked questions concerning uh, areas of science that those around her could not answer and could not give her a, a, an understanding of. But whatever these questions were, she asked Solomon, and Solomon answered, and in his answer, she she recognized that's true. Isn't it amazing how truth is like that? When, when we hear truth, something in our spirit is confirming to, yes, that's true. Yes, I, I, I understand that and it fits and it makes sense and I can see where, where that truth is. And so as Solomon spoke to her, she heard and she recognized the wisdom of his sayings. And what we say matters. What we say matters. Sometimes we're so flippant with our words. We, we have a tendency just to spout off uh, when people talk, when we talk to people or people talk to us. And, and, and we have a tendency to, to uh, speak in ways that are not wise. And, and heaven help us that a lot of times our speech turns to foolish jesting, as the Bible talks about, or, or uh, things that are not convenient. We begin to speak about those things that are, are not uh, of truth and not of wisdom and we allow those things to begin to infiltrate uh, our conversation, and we have to be careful. As a believer, our speech is, the, is one of the first things people actually recognize about us, how we talk. Uh, we ought to put away foolishness from us. We ought to put away foolish talking. We ought to put away cursing. Someone once said that uh, cursing is the attempt of an ignorant mind to express itself. And, and I, I'm not meaning demeaning, trying to demean people that, uh, that do curse. There are many intelligent people that curse, but it's not just intelligence, mental book smarts. Um, it's the ability of the soul to express itself in a meaningful way without resorting to baser words to try and uh, find that expression. And Solomon was a man who expressed himself by truth and by the Word of God, and we know that he did have the Word of God. He, he would have had already had the, uh, the five books of Moses. He would have had the writings of David and the Psalms uh, and uh, the, the understanding. And matter of fact, I, I think it's interesting how a lot of the Proverbs also have very similar or same statements in the book of Psalms that we can see where God's wisdom was given to David by inspiration, and Solomon was wise enough to recognize those things and draw them out. Now, there are many other statements in Proverbs that are not in Psalms, but it's, it, it's something that he brought forward from his father and from the Word of God, and what we say makes a difference. We have to be careful how we answer. 
We shouldn't be rash to answer. We shouldn't be hasty to answer. And we have to be patient and calm. You know, one of the things that um, as a in, in public speaking is a problem, and I've done, I notice in myself, I've done this a bit this morning, is when someone gets up and speaks and they say, um, 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 uh, in prayer, a lot of times people do this. We add in thought filler words, and let me say this for your thought and, and thought fodder, don't use the name of God as a vain thing, a thought filler word in your prayer where you use the word Lord over and over and over at the end of every statement to gather your thinking to be able to move on. God knows who you're talking to, and everyone else knows who you're talking to when you're praying. So using God's name repeatedly like that uh, can be a thought filler thing, and it can be, I'm not saying it's the equivalent of cursing, but it certainly is using God's name in a vain way, not not in a purposeful way. And we ought to be careful about the name of God. We ought to be careful about how we use the name of God and not using it uh, in an improper way. Sometimes we do that in prayer. I, I know I'll, I've heard, I hear that a lot uh, from people in prayer. What we say matters. How we say it matters. Sometimes we need to just slow our speech down to match our thinking. And, and uh, some people would talk very slowly at that pace, and some people would talk slower at that pace. But all of us should be considerate of the fact that what we say demonstrates to those around us whether there's wisdom present in us. And even the scriptures uh, talk to us about the fact that if a man holds his peace, he's counted as wise because he doesn't overstay, oversay things. He doesn't, uh, doesn't just babble uh, off. My mom used to say, better to be silent and thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt, right? And we have to be cautious about that fact. And sometimes we speak far too quickly. We speak far too much. And we say things that people then go, that guy's speaking foolishness. That guy's babbling. He, he's talking out of his head. He doesn't know what he's talking about, and we have to learn to withhold that. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, the Bible says that we're to study to be what? Quiet. Study to be quiet. That is, we have to practice withholding uttering foolish things and not speaking out of our head about things that we do not know. If you don't know about something, don't speak about it. Acknowledge the fact that you don't know about that. There's, listen, there's a difference between ignorance and foolishness or ignorance and stupidity. Uh, ignorance can be fixed. You can study and learn and overcome ignorance. Stupidity is the inability to learn. Ignorance is the unknowing of a particular topic. And so we have to recognize when we are ignorant about a topic, when we don't know much about a topic, and not try and promote ourselves. That comes from pride. That comes from a, a sense of arrogance or a desire for others to see us in a, in a certain way, rather than simply yielding ourselves to the fact that I don't know everything about everything, and I don't need to know everything about everything. I don't need everyone to think I do. But when the Queen of Sheba came to Solomon, when she asked him these questions, here's what the Bible tells us, that God gave him wisdom, and it says there was nothing hid from Solomon, uh, which he told her not. In other words, God gave him the knowledge, God gave him the wisdom to be able to answer her questions. And that speech, as he spoke as God gave that to him, it answered her questions, and she saw wisdom. So the first thing, what we say, what we say demonstrates wisdom. Secondly, what we do. It says in verse number three, when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, when she saw the way that things were, when she saw the works that he had done and, and uh, the way things were done in that sense, uh, when she saw the deeds, if you will, uh, of Solomon, she saw wisdom there. When people come in to your area, maybe uh, the, the, the place that you work or, or the uh, home that you have, and, and they see what you do, do they see wisdom? 
Do they see a, a wisdom in the doing of things, the way that things are, are, uh, are presented and the way that things are done? What we do matters. Sometimes we waste our time. Um, I, I'm not saying that every moment of every day ought to be uh, measured to its fullest uh, profitability in that sense. We need downtime. And by the way, there's a certain amount of wisdom in regards to rest and to taking that downtime um, that uh, the Bible gives us clearly. No one in the New Testament told us more that we ought to come apart and rest than Christ did. And and let me just say this in, in regards to that idea— I do believe that God allows things sometimes to happen. I'm not saying God causes pandemics or anything like that. Um, I know that there's some that would would uh, try and call this out as a uh, the judgment of God, and and I don't know um, one way or another whether whether it is. But I do know this that in the Old Testament, when Israel wasn't taking proper rest and they weren't observing the rest that God had asked them to do, that God allowed sometimes uh, conflict or pestilence or various things to come to create rest in them. You recognize what I'm saying? That God brought this situation where they didn't have a choice but to rest. And one of the things that I, I've thought of in, in regard to the situation going on, there's some people that go seven days a week nonstop. They're always going, always moving, always running, and they're not resting. And boy, what an interesting time for us that we're kind of told, stay at home, don't go out, stay there, just, just you know, work at home if you need to, but if you can do, if you can do it, just stay home and don't do anything. And right now, it's maybe the first time in my lifetime that I've been told not doing anything is wise, right? Staying home and doing nothing is wise. But even the Bible tells us there's a wisdom in ordering our rest in a proper way. What we do, if we over rest, if we're, if we're constantly resting and we're not engaged in, in the doing of things, then people say, well, they're lazy. They're not wise. They're not prudent in gathering and storing and, and, and all the things that they need to be doing to protect and preserve uh, their provision. But at the same time, if we never rest, there's a lack of wisdom in that as well. There has to be a time of rest. And what a great time this is right now for you to learn to rest in the Lord. Let me challenge you. Don't just turn on the television and sit in front of it 24 hours a day. Be wise in how you use your time at home. Spend time with the Lord. Spend time encouraging others. You can't go out and see others, maybe some of you, but right now you can get on the telephone or you can send messages, texts, and emails uh, of encouragement to one another and, and uh, challenging one another. Take the time to, to do with your family what you ought to have been doing. Turn off the television and sit and talk and play board games or, or things like that or tell stories stories to one another. Do things with your family. Spend time with your family. There's wisdom in that. Even right now, in the midst of this situation, what you do with your time will tell what wisdom you have. How are you spending the time God's given you right now for rest? Don't waste it. Don't lose this opportunity. Boy, I tell you, there's nothing better for children than to spend time with their parents. And, and uh, I saw uh, a little uh, meme course. That's what's um, interesting right now. Like the world's on fire and memes are going crazy. Uh, but um, uh, I saw this meme about, uh, about um, how, you know, boom, all of a sudden everyone was a homeschool family, you know, and, and another one about how uh, parents are about to find out that the teacher wasn't the problem, you know, uh, those type of things. But, uh, you know, when we look at that opportunity in our home, don't look at it in a negative fashion, look at it in a positive fashion. I get to spend time with my kids, and I get to spend some quality time. Don't waste the opportunity. Spend quality time with your kids. Be wise in what you do with your family. So what we say, what we do. Then thirdly, what we do with what we have. What we do with what we have. Now, I, I can't 
do anything about what I have in the sense of I can't, I, I, we work and we labor to, to uh, obviously to receive a, a reward from our, our employer. Our, our, we receive our paychecks and those type of things. But in general, what I have is what I have. And I can be diligent with what I have. I, I can be prudent with what I have. I can use what I have in a proper way. I can do right things with what I have, but what I have is what I have. And so what I meant by this is, What you have, don't worry about, well, I'm not as wealthy as Solomon. I I don't have as much as Solomon had. No, you don't have as much as Solomon had, but what are you doing with what you do have? What are you doing with your resources right now? Are you being wise with them? Are you being prudent with them? Are you putting them to proper use? Being wise with what we have means that we're faithful to give. It means that we're faithful to uh, put God first in our finances. And we see the foolish man in the New Testament who, instead of recognizing his debt to God and giving to the Lord, said, I'm just going to build myself bigger barns and I'm going to lay up in store and I'm going to say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Uh, take thine ease. And, and uh, that man became completely focused on his goods. And we shouldn't be focused on our goods as an end to themselves. We shouldn't be focused on our money as an end unto itself. We should always remember that our resources, what we have, are tools to allow us to do what God has called us to do. Now, God may not have called you in a full-time ministry as such as a pastor or a, a missionary or evangelist, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to use the resources he's given you to accomplish his work that he's given you to do. If he's called you to be a Sunday school teacher, you ought to use your resources to be the best Sunday school teacher you can be. If he's called you to be in the bus ministry, use your resources and order yourself to be able to do that. And by the way, I think part of prudence and wisdom in that regard is laying up in store in preparation for the opportunity to be able to give more time to the Lord, not less time to the Lord. Let me speak of that in just a different way. Um, I'm, I am mindful of the fact that there will come a day when I won't be as efficient or effective as a pastor and the ministry for me is going to change. There's going to come a day when I need to not be pastoring the church, but I can still minister and serve God and where I can give my time and abilities to the Lord. If you're called into a ministry of service, and and again, I'm not talking about pastor missionary, I'm talking about serving the Lord in some capacity, don't look toward retirement as the day when I don't have to serve God anymore. A pastor shouldn't be looking toward that that idea. When I think of not pastoring, I'm not thinking of stepping back from my service for God. I'm thinking of being able to do more of whatever God has for me to do. And that ought to be your mindset. I'm preparing for the opportunity to be able to do more. Unfortunately, I know a lot of pastors who didn't prepare for the future. And now then a lot of times they stay in the pastorate longer than they should. And the church begins to diminish and the ministry begins to wane because they didn't prepare wisely with what they had. And and you might say, well, you know, preacher, they didn't have large salaries or they didn't have this or that. That's true. And I'm, and, and, and I'm not diminishing that that reality. Some of them did not have large salaries and some of them did not have a, a lot of excess But what are you doing with the excess you have? What are you doing to prepare to be able to do more for God later than you're able to do today? What we have, what we do with what we have matters. And when the queen of Sheba saw Solomon, she said, man, I hear what he says. It shows wisdom. I see what he does. It shows wisdom. I see what he's doing with his resources. That shows wisdom. And then she saw this, that how he was organized. In verse number four, it it says, um, and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers. In other words, she saw how the servants were organized. She saw how people ministering were in their structure and in their order. and, And she saw wisdom in that. And organization does matter. 
um, I, I'm honest here about organization. I'm, I'm way more focused on organizing things concerning our church, concerning ministries, concerning the, the uh, order of, for instance, our services. And right now, the structure of how we're doing things, we're, we're trying to conform to the requests of our, uh, of our state, our governor, for the sake of the health of people. We, we care about people. We don't want people to be hurt, Right. But there still needs to be an order, an organization, and there's a wisdom to order those type of things. I'm way more focused on that than sometimes in personal organization. My wife and I were having a conversation about that um, this week. My desk has a tendency to just get piled with things. And she said, why don't you just take a day every week and clean off your desk? I said, because I'm much more focused. I'm more focused on making sure everything else in the church is structured than, than that stuff. But I need to take time for that. How we're organized demonstrates wisdom. If, if you walk into a place and it's chaotic, you go, wow, the leadership here is not demonstrating wisdom. That everything's in disorder. Everything's in chaos. If you walk into uh, my office right now, you'd think my whole world was in chaos with papers piled on my desk and so forth. But, you know, there has to be a proper organization. And when the world looks out, now, thankfully, you don't see my desk. It's locked away in a room. Amen. Um, but uh, uh, here I am telling you about this. That's probably not wise. But when people look at your life, when they look at your business, when they look at the church, how they recognize wisdom is they look and go, how are they ordering things? How are they structuring things? What kind of uh, a plan do they have? And they're carrying out that plan in such a way that it demonstrates a wisdom. And when she saw how the servants worked and, and how the minister served and all of those type of things, the organization of what Solomon had done demonstrated wisdom. Number five, and this is an interesting one to me, how you look, how you look demonstrates wisdom to the world. In verse number four, again, it says what she saw their apparel and his cupbearers also and their apparel. Isn't that an interesting um, notice here in this passage that it wasn't just what he said, what he did, what he did with what he had and how he was organized, but also how he looked. All right. Now, I want to be cautious on this because I'm not trying to uh, to say, boy, we ought to we ought to have some uh, you know grand appearance and all of this type of stuff. She actually wasn't talking about how Solomon looked. She was talking about how everyone else looked because um, sometimes the the king maybe would be of, of course adorned in royal uh, uh, vestiges and and he of course would be uh, would would be that way. But she looked at the servants and she said, how do they look? How are they how are they keeping themselves? How is he concerned about the appearance uh, of those uh, of those others that are here and that are serving? As a member of the church, you need to be cognizant of this. When you come to church and lost folks come in, they're looking at you. They're looking to see how do you look? And I'm not talking about dressing, you know, to the nines and, and uh, having on a three-piece suit and all that type of stuff. I I'm talking about, are you kept? Are you properly dressed? Do you look appropriate to the setting and circumstances? If you come in, now, again, let me say, let me step back a second. If you work till 630 and you have to get here in your work clothes to come to church, do so, all right? But tuck your shirt in when you come in, Amen. I mean, look like you're coming at some respect that you have a, uh, that you have a, a reverence for the house of God and, and that you want to look presentable. Even if you're in your work clothes, do what you can to look presentable, right? Uh, again, it's not about how we look for others. It's about how we look for God. But there's a wisdom the world sees in us in how we present ourselves and how we look. Um, I was up at North Haven, uh, before the restriction came down, they, they were having their, um, missions conference and my mom and dad got up and sang and, uh, they were, my dad was wearing a, a blue suit and, and so forth. My mom was wearing a blue, uh, I guess top of, I guess that's what ladies would call it. Um, but, uh, anyway, they, they matched in that, 
that blue, and I, I made mention of the fact, boy, I like those groups that color coordinate and, and all that type of stuff. And I notice here at church, I notice that sometimes we'll have uh, our choir will color coordinate on special days. Uh, um, sometimes the groups will come and they'll all be wearing, you know, maybe uh, gray suits and red ties or things like that. And, and, you know, I notice things like that, but guess what? Others also notice things like that. What does it say? It's, it's not saying we're all the same. It's saying we put thought into how we look. We put thought into how we look. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone should dress the same. It means that how we look catches the attention of others and tells them that we were thoughtful of it. We took some wisdom for it, and we ought to be appropriate to that which we are doing. We ought to be appropriate to that. And so she saw the apparel. Uh, boy, there's a lot that we could go into about apparel. We're not going to get into all of the thoughts about apparel here today, but just the idea of when others look at you, they are judging your wisdom based on how you look. If you look shad, shab, uh, sh shabby, if you look unkept, they look at you and say, that guy doesn't have a lot of wisdom. But if you look kept, if you look proper, if you're a tidy person, they look at you and say, that guy probably has wisdom, right? That's just the way the world's perspective works. It's important to understand that. Number six, how you worship. Notice in verse four, it says, and his ascent by which he went up to the house of the Lord. She watched how he was worshiping. She watched how he approached the house of God and how he went up to worship. She wasn't, by the way, able to go up with him. According to the scriptures, she wouldn't have been allowed into the place of worship. She wasn't a Jew, but she watched him going. And there's a wisdom that's demonstrated in how we worship. Does the world see wisdom in what we're doing? One of the thoughts I've had continually about this time that we're in and the situations that we're in is this idea. And, and listen, there's a big struggle right now amongst churches and pastors about what it is that we ought to be doing. And some are saying, no, we should not, we should not uh, withhold from having public services and, and we ought to be, uh, you know, not letting the government tell us what to do and not let the, the government, uh, you know, uh, force us out from having public services and <clears throat> these type of things. But let me, let me give you my thoughts, and I, I think I may have shared some of this, but just let me give you my thoughts on that just a second. Um, I don't believe that, that the Corona-19 virus, uh, COVID-19, was started in China and spread across the entire world and has closed down uh, dozens of countries across the world, killed thousands of people, and infected here in the United States just so that the government could close down our churches. That's a grand conspiracy theory, right? Um, I also see what's going on in our culture, and I notice this, that governments and governors are many times forcing businesses to close and requesting churches. They're not forcing churches, they're requesting churches. Now, to me... There's a difference between force and request. And right now we're in a unique situation. We're in a situation where people's lives are literally in the balance. And, and whether you accept that or not, that is how the world sees things. Okay, The world sees things in that regard. Are you concerned about the lives of others? Are you concerned about the welfare of others? And how we act and how we worship during this time demonstrates to the world a level of wisdom. For us to defy and say, we're not going to let the government tell us not to assemble, the world looks at that and the world says, they're foolish. They're foolish. Look at them getting together in groups when, the, when everyone recognizes, all the people in the country recognize that, that this is spread dramatically. And by the way, don't think that that can't happen in church. As a matter of fact, um, uh, there was a death yesterday 
of a preacher, I think it was yesterday or, or the day before, up in Tulsa, and evidently there's a large number of preachers that are infected and in hospitals right now because they went to a preacher's gathering after this was all going on, knowing that they were, I guess, not supposed to get together in large groups. And and the majority of them, I guess, from what I understand last night, a lot of them are infected and now in hospitals and dying. Ah, um, I just got a notice last night, Brother Kenny Baldwin, I, and I'm not diminishing Brother Baldwin and saying he did something he shouldn't, but Brother Kenny Baldwin is in the hospital right now. Um, pastors out in uh, Baltimore area, uh, DC area out that, that way. Um, and, uh, he, uh, he's in the hospital. He's, he's had this, uh, COVID-19 was confirmed yesterday that he has it and he's on a, um, a medic uh, treatment out there in the hospital. And, and I promise you, you're going to hear likely about people that, you know, and even preachers that die because of this is it's not foolishness to obey authority. Okay. In other words, our obedience to the authority that God's put over us for the cause of watching for our health. They're not trying to make rules to keep us from having church. They're trying to watch for the public good, and there's a wisdom in heeding that. We can still worship God, and we ought to worship God personally. We ought to be worshiping God in our homes. We ought to worship God as much as we can in the confinement. Now, if things were turned and the government was coming and saying, we're, we're closing churches because we don't like what they're teaching, we don't like what they're preaching, then wisdom would say, stand up and proclaim and don't, don't let yourself uh, be uh, coward to the, to the offense or opposition position to the gospel. That's a different question than what we're facing right now. And the world looks at us and they're looking to see in churches, are they wise? Are they being prudent in this time? Do they care about people or just about their attendance or just about, and here's how the world's going to look at this, or do they just care about their offerings? Do they just care about the money? That's how the world views things. And so they're going to look at us and they're going to look at how we worship and they're going to judge whether or not we have wisdom. And finally, what kind of attitude you instill in those around you? What kind of attitude you instill or, or inspire maybe in those around you? It says in verse number seven, happy are thy men and happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and hear thy wisdom. The queen of Sheba said, man, not only do I see, hear what you say and see what you do and notice what you do with what you have and how you're organized and how everyone looks and how you worship, but I also have noticed everybody here is happy. I noticed the attitude that people have uh, in this place, and what an interesting uh, thing that is. And, and can I say that when people come around you, what kind of attitude do they notice in you, right? Do they notice an attitude that is encouraging, that is happy, that is uh, positive, or are you someone that's demonstrating a negative, uh, uh, pessimistic, uh, down, depressed attitude? What kind of attitude are you giving and what kind of attitude do you inspire in those around you all right now think about it like this she was attributing the happiness of the the servants there to the wisdom of solomon and she was saying he inspired a good attitude in people around him so it's not just about what attitude he had but it's about what attitude he inspired in those that were around him. So ask this question, what attitude do you inspire in people around you? Is it a panicked attitude right now? Is it a fearful, fretful attitude? Uh, or, or is it an attitude that says, hey, everything's going to be okay. Yes, it's a bad situation. Yes, there's problems. Yes, there's chaos around us, but we don't have to give in to it. We can trust God in the midst of it. Yes, it's going to be a bad situation. We, we may know people that pass, and there's going to be possibly sadness. And, and certainly, if, if I know people that pass, there's going to be sadness and mourning. But at the same time, I should not be instilling that attitude in others. One of the things I think we see right now, and, and quite honestly, to me, is very evident, is the difference right now between our president and the media and the media is trying to be judgmental toward our president because they're saying, you're being too positive. How dare you try and give people hope? And, and uh, this kind of an interesting thing I saw in the, um, in the uh, 
press conference, I, I watched a snippet of it yesterday, uh, that, you know, how, how dare you? Don't you think this optimism you have is, is going to be negative for people? No, no, no. Optimism is positive, amen? If the president got up and said, we're all going to die, ah! if he was as crazy as the media, imagine how chaotic this whole country would be. He's being wise. He's being prudent. He's, he's being realistic, I think, by saying, listen, it's a bad situation. There's things that, are, that we're facing we haven't faced. I've never faced these things before. We don't really know what's going to happen, but there's hope. There's promise. We're working toward it. We're doing what we can. And, and the media just hates it that he keeps being positive about things. And people look at this, and I promise you, people look at this and they go, He's being wise and they're being foolish. They're instilling panic instead of calmness. The job of a leader is to instill calm. It's to instill hope. It's to instill a forward vision instead of just chaotic pandemonium, right? And by the way, you are an influence on those around you. You're an influence on your family. What kind of attitude are you instilling in them? What kind of attitude are you inspiring in them? Is it a panicked attitude? You better be careful. What kind of attitude, mom, are you inspiring in your children? What kind of attitude are you inspiring at work? Listen, there's wisdom in the type of attitude we inspire. And when people are in trouble, when people are in need, they're going to look for someone that instills an attitude of positive, helpful happiness in those around them. They're not going to look for someone that's causing everybody to be in chaos, okay? So here we see some interesting things. How does the world recognize wisdom? What we say, what we do, what we do with what we have, how we're organized, how we look, how we worship, and the kind of attitude we inspire in those around us. I hope that you will demonstrate wisdom in your life and that you will consider this in regards to how the world is viewing you. And if there's a problem there, correct it. Make sure that your things are right with the Lord, that you are doing what you ought to do. And if you don't know how, ask God for wisdom, and he will give it to you. That's what the Bible tells us. What a blessing. God bless. Look forward to seeing you again soon.